you have a Bible, go ahead and open them up to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. But before we dive into this passage, I want to tell you a bit of a story. There was once a young man who was studying to become a lawyer at the age of 21. But one day while he was traveling home, he got caught in a huge thunderstorm. A powerful lightning bolt struck a tree right next to the road that he was traveling on. He was scared of the death, and in that near-death experience, he turned to God. Well, actually, he, he turned to the patron saint of distressed travelers, Saint Anne. But he said, if you'll spare my life, I promise to become a monk. His day, being a, a monk, was seen as the highest form of religious devotion that he could show. And so he was essentially like, you know, God, you've got me, you've woken me up, you've got my attention. If I live, I'll do absolutely everything I can do to live for you. This young man's name was Martin Luther. You may have heard of him. Soon after this, Luther kept his word. He became a devout, exemplary monk, doing everything that monks were supposed to do. He spent hours in prayer every day. He, he fasted for days on end. He, he would even physically beat his body in order to subdue his flesh. He would enter the confessional booth and begin confessing his sins for penance, and he would literally go on for hours. In fact, he, after a number of hours, the people listening to his confession would have to ask him to stop. Like, men, listen, go back to your room, come back when you've done something really bad. <laughs> Looking back, Luther once said, I was indeed a pious monk and followed the rules of my order more strictly than I can express. If ever a monk could obtain heaven by his monkish work, that's a nice word. <laughs> if ever a monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, I should certainly have been entitled to it. If it had continued much longer, I should have carried my mortification even to death by means of my watchings, prayers, reading, and other labors. Needless to say, this guy was way more religious than you. Or me. However, despite all of his rigorous devotion, Luther was plagued by doubt. Constantly plagued by doubt. He found no peace through his good works. He often bordered on despair. He always thought, have I done enough? Have I actually confessed all of my sins? I mean, I'm supposed to become righteous by doing all these good things, but how can righteousness come from my heart, which is so sinful? How can I stand before a holy God one day with works that are polluted at their source? Those questions kept him awake at night. They plagued him all the time. One of Luther's teachers, he tried to ease his worries by directing him to Scripture. And so Luther began to study in earnest, especially the book of Romans. And as he studied the words that are written on the page right in front of you, you've opened to, the truth of what God said hit him like a lightning bolt, which would change his life more dramatically than any real lightning bolt ever did. Luther said, when I discovered this, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. And the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. He had found his peace. He had found hope. Essentially, he had found faith. And not long after, he was hammering on Wittenberg's door about it. So what were the words that so impacted Martin Luther, and in turn, impacted the world? Look down with me at verses 16 and 17 in Romans 1. The Apostle Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first 
and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith toward faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now that might not sound very earth-shattering to you. But trust me, it is. Or at least it should be. These verses allude to a vital truth that I believe we all need to grasp. 500 years ago at this Protestant Reformation, they, which really has shaped our church, men, all the Protestant churches to this day, they reclaimed a number of biblical truths which have come to be known as solas. The truth we come to today here has been called the cornerstone of the Reformation. It was the centerpiece, the, the primary instigator of it all. The smoking gun, if you will. In Latin, it's sola fide. In English, faith alone. Can you pray with me that God would help us understand and apply his word today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at these words and other words from your holy word, we pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears. May we hear, understand, and apply what we hear. May we obey by the power of your Spirit. I pray that these truths would go forth from here and change our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, if you don't know what the gospel refers to there, the word gospel means good news. Good news. And the gospel is essentially the good news about how God saves us from sin through Jesus. Okay, so how God saves us from sin through Jesus. The, the good news always starts, though, with the bad news, which Paul explains here in Romans over the next few chapters. That, that every member of the human race, including you and me, is under God's wrath. <clears throat> and that our, that our sin is so widespread, it is despicable, it is damnable. And that no one is good. No one is righteous. And so, if we stand before a holy God one day, like Luther feared, we are sunk. But then the good news comes in, that God loved us despite our sin. And that he sent his son, Jesus, to earth to really succeed where we failed, to live a holy life. And then that son went to die a gruesome death on the cross in our place as our substitute. After which he, we believe he rose from the dead, like we sing about, he conquered over sin and death forever. Now, the most amazing thing about this, this story, this real, true story of Jesus, is that we didn't deserve an ounce of God's love. We didn't deserve this at all. We deserved his wrath. We should have been annihilated off the face of the earth. But he decided to love us by his sheer grace alone, like we studied a couple weeks ago. And Christ gave everything, pouring out all his life for us. And that's the gospel. That's the good news. And look here, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. That's the source, where it comes from. It's the power of God for salvation. So there's the purpose of the gospel to everyone who believes, to the Jew and the Greek. So that those are the recipients of the gospel. This verse is almost like a gift tag or a card that you attach to a present, right? Like, this gift is for Rachel from Luke. And, and why? Happy birthday, Happy right? This is the gift that God gives. It's from God for you, if you believe. And why? It's to give you the power you need for salvation or to be saved. 
Now listen, most of you go around every day worried about what other people think of me. Do they like me? Am I cool enough? Do they respect me? But what do they think of me? And if someone doesn't like us, it eats us up. Right? Did I do something? Did I say something? I mean, I, I hate it. It bothers me if someone I've never even met and never will be honks at me on the road. <laughs> that even eats us up. But what God thinks of us is infinitely more important than what other people think of us. We should care about that. And you should be concerned about the fact that you have wronged God. That you are alienated from Him. That a relationship is broken between you. That you have offended an all-powerful, perfect being that can't stand sin. Did you say something? Did you do something? Yes! A thousand times over. And you can never do enough good things to get yourself to make things right, get yourself on God's good side. God demands righteousness from us. That's what Scripture teaches. But righteousness is something that we simply don't have. But the good news, the gospel is that there is a solution. That God has made a solution. That God has sol really solved our dire predicament. The next verse, verse 17, says that God has revealed a righteousness of God. So a righteousness from God. A righteousness that can be given to us. And we can access. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So how does that happen? How can we be saved? How can things be made right? How can we become righteous? Right? We know the story. Jesus died and rose again. Okay. But how do those events from two millennia ago change us today? How do they impact our lives today? What are we supposed to do about it? What does the gospel demand from us? The answer to all those questions is faith. It's faith. That's what these verses make clear. Here's the major point I believe that we can learn. That God's gracious salvation is received by faith alone. God's gracious salvation can only be received by faith. It is received by faith alone. If faith is the key to having a restored and right relationship with God, then it really becomes critical that we understand faith so that we can have faith. So, but, the, but that word is really just thrown, a lot, it's thrown around a lot in Christian circles, right? So what is faith? What is faith? Is it just wistful or wishful thinking? Like, say your favorite hockey team is losing a game and someone whispers to you, have faith. They're saying, like, believe that they can still win or, or don't lose hope. Is that faith? No, the biblical picture of faith is quite a bit stronger than that. It's, it's more of a confidence. Like Hebrews 11, 1 says, it defines faith. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So assurance, conviction, is there's a confidence here. Faith is confident. It's certain. Another famous reformer, John Calvin, gave this definition. It says, faith is a firm and sure knowledge of God's favor towards us based on the truth of a free promise in Christ revealed to our minds and sealed on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's what faith is. Now, theologians usually identify three clear elements of biblical saving faith. Three elements. First, knowledge. Second, belief. And third, trust. Spurgeon described those three aspects as awareness, assent, 
and commitment. And now having some knowledge of God and the gospel is necessary. First step, we have to have knowledge. Romans 10 makes clear that you must hear about Jesus before you can be saved by Jesus. But knowledge isn't nearly enough. And just because I know about, say, Hitler and World War II doesn't make me a Nazi. Right? You can know about something, it doesn't connect you to that. Plenty of people know about Jesus' life and death. That does not make them right with God in the slightest. To have faith, knowledge has to move to belief. You might say assent, approval, or agreement. You have to assent to the fact that you're of your sin and your need for salvation. You have to agree with what God's Word says, that Christ did die and rise again. And you have to believe that Christ is then able to save you from sin and hell and death. But even believing that those things are true is not quite enough. After all, that puts your belief on the same plane as the beliefs of demons. The final part of faith is to decide to depend on Christ. To trust Him to save you personally. James Montgomery Boyce says, The third element of faith is a real yielding of oneself to Christ, which goes beyond knowledge, however full or accurate that knowledge may be, and even beyond agreeing with or being personally moved by the gospel. Really, it's, it's fully committing your life to the Lord, choosing to place your complete trust in Him. And when those three elements come together, you have true, saving, biblical faith. It may all happen in a single moment, but from then on, God considers you righteous. I have to clarify something really as a side note here. A couple weeks ago, I said something in our review that wasn't totally correct theologically. I said that belief and repentance are the two sides of faith. That's not accurate. Faith and repentance are the two sides of conversion, right, of becoming a Christian. Repentance, of course, is turning from sin. Faith is turning to Christ. And you can't have one without the other. But... Where I went wrong, they're not the same thing. Okay? They're distinct. What is true, though, is that living by faith will inevitably lead to a lifestyle of repentance. And as Martin Luther said in the very first of his 95 Theses, when the Lord Jesus Christ told his people to repent, he meant that all of life is to be characterized by repentance. But for Luther... Reading Romans 1.17 was really his light bulb moment, his aha moment. He studied this. For in, the, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Another version says, by faith from first to last. Douglas Moo explains that this emphasizes that God's righteousness is experienced by faith and nothing but faith. And then Paul's supporting argument for this is a little quote from the prophet Habakkuk. It said, As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Now, we may assume that that's a command. Right? If you're righteous, then live by faith. But that's not what this means. It means, if you have faith, you will be righteous and live. If you have faith, you'll be righteous and live. When Luther figured that out, it changed everything for him. He was like, wait a second, this righteousness that Paul is talking about is a righteousness that is given freely to unrighteous people. Whoa. Wait a second, so the, the, the righteousness by which I'm saved, or I can be saved, isn't my own righteousness. It's an alien righteousness. A righteousness that belongs to someone else, that comes from outside of us. 
Wow, I need that righteousness. Because I, I prove it by my life. I can't do it myself. I need that righteousness from outside of me. And that comes by faith. Now, I know this is pretty deep stuff. But do you have any inkling of how good this news is? Think about it. Every time we try to do enough good stuff to make God happy, we fail miserably. Right? And we end up in disappointment, even despair. I know what the cycle is like, right? Our, our personal righteousness tends to go up and down and up and down. This endless cycle. For example, despite our best intentions, none of us read the Bible and pray every day, right? We know we should, but we don't. Or we maybe we join a service team at church. Maybe on the music team or the hospitality team or working with children. But in the back of our minds, as we do that, we're, we're always thinking, I should be doing more. I should be doing more. Or we live with a constant guilt about not evangelizing enough or not giving enough. Or every time we think that we have a habitual sin beaten, we fall back into it. And we go back to our accountability partner with our, with our heads down in shame. Listen. See here. The righteousness you need doesn't come from you. The righteousness you need doesn't come from you. It can't. Right? You're hopeless. And so am I. We don't even meet our own standards, let alone God's. And even when we know that that is true, we subconsciously revert to trying to earn God's favor. And then we always imagine that God is displeased with our level of goodness or righteousness. But no. If we have faith in Christ, then God sees us as if we have Christ's righteousness. And by that faith, the righteous in God's sight will live. They will be saved. If you flip over the next page in your Bibles, towards the end of Romans 3, Paul really hammers this point home in a, in a monumental summary of the gospel. Say. I don't have time to go in depth onto this passage. I'm sure there's going to be parts as I read it that you do not fully understand right now. That's okay. All right? But as I read this, I want you to notice every mention of faith or belief. All right? Every mention of faith or belief. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 21. It says this, But now the righteousness of God, there's that term again, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness as, at the present time so that he might be, the, be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. See how many times it's repeated over and over and over? Notice especially verse 25. It really proves our main point that I've given you. 
whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So we receive salvation by faith. And then verse 28 makes it crystal clear. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. We are justified by faith alone and nothing else. Now, that passage has a lot of big theological words in it. Propitiation, redemption, and the like. At the, at the risk of oversimplifying them, these all refer to different aspects of our salvation. And they're all parts of our salvation. But none of them are more important than the word justification here. Paul said it a number of times. It says, verse 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In verse 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Calvin described justification as the main hinge on which salvation turns. So what does it mean to be justified? Justification here means to declare to be righteous. To declare to be righteous. Boyce explains that justification is God's answer to the most important of all human questions. How can a man or a woman become right with God? We are not right with God in ourselves. On the contrary, we are in dreadful trouble with God. We are under His wrath for our sins. So either we must become right with God, or we must perish eternally. Justification is... You can't even imagine how important it is. Picture a courtroom. And yeah, this will help us understand this better. Okay, a courtroom, a man is on trial for murder. A murder he did in fact commit. Alright, so we know that we know that he is guilty. A trial has taken place, witnesses have been called, arguments have been heard, and the judge is ready to pass down his conviction and his sentence. Right now, question. What made the man on trial guilty? The crime, right? He committed the murder. That made him guilty. Is he condemned yet? No. He is not condemned yet. The coming conviction from the judge is going to determine that. The judge will either say he's guilty or he's not guilty, and then the man will be either condemned or acquitted. If the judge were to declare not guilty and bang his gavel, that is justification. Right? The judge saying not guilty and passing down that sentence of acquittal. Justification is really the opposite of condemnation. It's declaring to be righteous instead of declaring to be Guilty. It's God choosing to see wicked sinners as righteous despite their sin and their guilt. Now, con get this. Condemnation or justification don't make sinners guilty or not guilty. They only regard them as such. They declare them to be so. And Paul tells us here, we can be justified by God's grace through our faith. Now, Romans 3 is answering the objection here that doesn't that make God an unjust judge? Right? I mean, if a judge was swayed by evidence and facts to find someone not guilty, that's fine. But if all the evidence, the entire trial, points to the fact that they were guilty and a judge acquits them anyway, that's a miscarriage of justice. It's not right to let the guilty just walk free. Enter Jesus. Jesus' death is how God could be perfectly just and gracious at the same time. Okay, Paul is like, yeah, you're right. Okay? It would not be right for God to just let us off the hook. That wouldn't be right of him to do. But God didn't let sin off the hook. He did it. He paid for it all in Christ. Look at verse 24. We've all sinned and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So he had been letting the guilty off. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's like Christ stepped up to the judge's bench and said, I will take this guilty sinner's punishment myself. So pour your justice on me, and then you can actually let them go. We might go, well, we'd still be guilty. And Christ goes, not if I give you my righteousness. And that's what happens when we have faith. It's incredible. We exchange our sin for his sinlessness. We may see more of this next week when we study Christ alone. But it is a crucial distinction now that the faith that saves us is faith in Christ. In Christ. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who believe. Verse 26. We should show his righteousness in the present time so that he might be the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So here's the point. God's gracious salvation is received by faith alone. Which looks like trusting in Christ's work. Trusting in Christ's work. And we receive salvation by faith alone, trusting in Christ's work. Let me put it this way. Billions of people today trust that if God is real, that he'll save them. Okay? They believe that they, they, they're generally good person, that some kind of pleasant afterlife will await them. Right? So you could say that, that most people have some level of basic, albeit naive, faith. But that's not true faith. That's not true faith. True faith trusts God to save them based on what Christ has done. And if we trust God to save us based on what we've done, based on how good we've been, based on our generally good life, we will be tragically mistaken. Here's a true statement which may surprise you. We are actually saved by works. We're saved by works. The catch is that we're not saved by our own works. We're saved by Christ's works. And we can be justified because he lived a sinless, perfect life. Because he died a bloody death in our condemned place. And because he lives again, offering life to all who believe him. Those are the works by which we're saved. We do need to be righteous. And in Jesus' works, as we read, the righteous shall live by faith. If you have never done so, I would urge you today to place your faith in Jesus today. To believe that He, that God will save you because of what Jesus did on your behalf. And to commit your life, your, your whole life, to living by faith in Him. If you have been told that you need anything else to get right with God, forget that. And your salvation, both now and in eternity, depends on your faith alone. Sometimes, we don't abandon faith alone by adding requirements to faith. We often lose faith alone by reducing or minimizing what it means to have faith. We preach an easy believism, a cheap faith that doesn't cost anything. We say it's, it's just a mental change of mind, or it's an asking Jesus in your heart. The true faith is costly. Faith demands a total change of heart. Faith will lead to changed lives. You cannot artificially separate faith 
from repentance and growing in holiness. Yes, they're different things, but they will always go together. So be warned. Right? If your faith is not altering your life, then it may not be real faith at all. It's likely not real faith at all. And be forewarned. Placing all your trust in Jesus may be easy, but it will cost you everything. But it's worth it. Way beyond it. And it's the only way you'll ever be saved. So I implore you that even today, in this very moment, choose to stake everything on Christ. For those of us who already have faith, we should really rejoice in this faith that God has given us. You are not saved by what you can't accomplish. You get that? Let me say that again. You're not saved by what you can't accomplish anyway. That's good news. There's no need for despair then. You are saved by what Christ has accomplished. And that should blow us away. It should give us peace, Hope, this comfort, much more. As Romans 5, 1-2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And I also encourage you to take Paul's example in Romans 1 to heart. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. We should feel no shame in being justified by faith in Christ and not ourselves. Even though the world says that you've got to earn everything in life. Even though the world mocks faith in something that you can't see. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Because one day it's going to make all the difference. From another angle, you can say, don't be ashamed, even though you are sinful and powerless to save yourself. It's never shameful to admit a true weakness. You can't do it. But Christ can. No shame. Our saving faith must be in Him alone. So place all your trust in Jesus. Also, recognize that all of us have a tendency to slip back into trying to do it all ourselves. It's just natural. And that gets at another crucial aspect of true saving faith we must mention. And God's gracious salvation is received by faith alone, excluding our own works. Excluding our own works. We, when we receive salvation through our faith, our good works are excluded from the equation. Right? The, the alternative to faith alone is faith and something else. And the Catholic Church in the days of the Reformation insisted that it was faith and. Yes, you had to have faith to be saved. It was part of the equation. A major part of the equation. Even the most important part of the equation. But to really be considered righteous by God, you needed more than just faith. You also needed good works. You needed the church, confession, baptism, last rites, etc. And a multitude of churches, Catholic and not, today, still believe this. Or they teach it implicitly. We can't trust Christ's work and our work to get us to God one day. That won't happen because they are mutually exclusive as far as salvation is concerned. They are actually direct opposites. One is holy, the other is wicked. Scripture says that even all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now, in order to be saved, we can't count on anything of our own, not our good morals, not our good 
character, not our reputations, not our community service, not our family background, not our church involvement. Some of you have been thinking all along today, I have faith in Christ. Of course I do. But maybe you don't. And what you have is really faith in yourself. You may think that you are strong enough or good enough on your own. And that one day, God's going to be impressed with how you live. Or you're counting on your family background or your church background to count for something one day. Counting on that. You assume that God is going to judge you based on where you came from or who you're associated with. Maybe you've bought the lie that you have to do certain things to make God happy. Right? You've got to be baptized. You've got to be active in church. You've got to tithe a certain amount. You've got to pray three or four times a day. Or, or you've got to just avoid certain sins. Right? Maybe like hate or adultery or violence. Don't smoke, don't chew, don't grow those girls that do. <laughs> and you're confident that you'll be able to avoid enough sins to matter with you. Really, all of those are just various forms of trusting in ourselves of having faith in ourselves. Your faith is in your goodness, or your family, or your church, or your work ethic, or your track record, or your resolve, or your strength, or your endurance, or your rules, or your good works. I have family members who insist that they'll be saved at least partially by what they do. The, the faith is important, but it's not enough. My heart weeps for them. Because they're trusting in something that will never, ever, ever be good enough. Listen to this from Brandon Smith. We can't have faith in ourselves. We make terrible saviors. On our best day and our worst day, we still need Christ. It's so easy to forget that simple truth. Pride wants us to look inward for justification. After all, it's pretty easy to justify ourselves since we always think we're right. But the gospel wants us to look up in faith and see Christ, the only one who can truly justify us for eternity. The world continually beats into our heads the belief that we can justify ourselves. We can be a good person if we just become a better parent, a better friend, or a better neighbor. If we're just kind enough to others, the world tells us, surely God won't judge us. But that's not true. Without Christ, God will surely judge us. And so we must place our trust in something that may someone outside of ourselves. We make terrible saviors. But there is one savior. Now, as we recently saw, God created us to do good works here on earth. Ephesians 2.10. But our good works are meant to follow our faith. Okay? They don't produce our faith. Some of you who know your Bibles may be thinking, well, what about James 2? If you, if you know that passage, it's a passage that, on first, on first glance, it can seem to contradict faith alone. But I don't believe James was contradicting faith alone at all, this truth at all. He was just saying that true faith, true faith will always be accompanied by works. It will always be accompanied by works. Calvin said, faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. I think that's a really nice way to put it to help us understand. Faith alone justified, but the faith that justified is never alone. And by the way, God should get the credit for us having faith at all. It's a gift from Him. It's Ephesians 2 8 9 said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, this faith, is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, you may have noticed some of that same theme on not boasting in our passages in Romans today. 
For example, look at chapter 3, verse 27. Paul said, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. See, we've got to, to lose our pride that tells us we're all that. Or that you're a better person than other people around you. As if that's going to matter. We have nothing to boast in before God that will carry any weight except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so all the glory rightfully goes to God. And that leads to our final point. God's gracious salvation is, is received by faith alone, revealing God's righteousness. Revealing God's righteousness. When we receive God's salvation by faith, it reveals God's righteousness. Our personal salvation, your personal salvation, reveals something about God to everyone with eyes to see. As Romans 1.17 said, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And chapter 3 also keeps saying that all this was meant to point to God. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. Verse 25, Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness. Verse 26, it was to show God's righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So have you come to realize that, that, you, that if you've been saved, you've been saved to show God off? Yeah. Okay, that's why Jesus came, to reveal God's righteousness. It's why he died. To make God's righteousness available to us. And it's why God wants us to receive Him by faith. To extend His righteousness into our hearts. And to demonstrate how His righteousness changes hearts and lives. In saving us, God is really at work on something that is way bigger than us. Something that is of infinite value and importance. That's multiplying his glory. Showing up. And something that he's at work as something that if we are now invited to join in and be a part of by faith. Is that not amazing? The righteous shall live by faith. You realize that. Our faith, our need for faith is only a temporary need. One day we will no longer need to hope in things unseen because they will be seen. Our eyes will behold God, the giver of grace, the author of our salvation, the only Savior. And from that moment on, sola fide will be expired. It will be obsolete. As Christian Georg tells us, one day sola fide will become sola optica. You don't need faith when you know what color your Savior's eyes are. Until then, we live by faith alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, for those of us who have faith, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your grace that you poured out on us through Christ. While we were yet sinners, and Christ died for us. Thank you that we can now rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. For those here who don't have faith, Lord, I pray that you would move in their hearts. That you would open their eyes. Help them to see their need for you, even if they've assumed they haven't needed you for years. Open their eyes, convict them, draw them to the cross, and show them your mercy. And we pray.
pray this, celebrate what you've done and what you're yet to do. We look forward to that day when our eyes see you. And may we live by faith until that day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.